one jumps in the water and doesn't get eaten by a polar bear, and the other ones fall in after. Um, and so you guys, I think by just being here, are the first penguins, and the other ones are coming out. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jules. Um, so to, while we're thanking people, thank Eva and um, and Alan <laughs> for all they did in helping, particularly Alan who endured Costco with me today, which was a lot of fun. Um, so thank you all for coming. All right, did you get the Google Hangouts? It's, it's yeah. live. We're streaming live all all so over the planet. Um, so we are streaming. Are we recording it or yes. not? Yes. Yeah, and we're recording it, which I know some people wanted to do that. So just a little brief word about what is involved law, because we keep getting that question. So Jules and I came up with this idea last year, and it's evolving, no pun intended, but stay tuned because we are going to do some big things with it over the summer, and it's all about moving forward with technology and law and just better integration of the efforts uh, so that all of us are pulling with our wonderful startups and further along companies such as LegalZoom and Clio, we aren't all just like a big swirling mess. So that's, uh, that's my goal with it. So we're going to do a quick first panel. And so we'll introduce the panel and then they can come up. And then after that, we're going to do a brainstorming. Uh, anything? I guess. Anything in particular people want to talk about, hear about? Are you guys based? Oh, it depends. So, um, <laughs> 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 we're going to a long time in place. Um, my company, Aaron Esper, we're based in, I'm based in New York, and this is there with the same office that we're in here in Pittsburgh. Mary's based in Phoenix, but she's probably never there because I see her everywhere around the country. Um, I think legal tech is. Blossoming in the US, so we are law as, a, as an organization, which is not officially an organization yet, it will be by the summer. Um, we are where we are. Um, which is and we're including Canada. I'm Canadian. Cleo <laughs> presented here today. We talked with Ryerson, who are interested in hosting an Evolve Law in Toronto. I didn't tell you about that yet. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so that so our, doesn't really matter. We're all most of us are SaaS-based companies, and so it doesn't matter where we are. But uh, Phoenix to LA is a very short trip, 55 minutes. And the legal industry, as you guys know, is pubs. And if those pubs, if change happens in those pubs, the rest of the world and the country follows. Um, so we're trying to make an impact in the largest legal markets, and um, therefore move the industry forward in the way that every other industry is moving forward by using technology to become more efficient and enable um, better practice. So that's the goal. Okay, so our first panel, um, some of this is redundant. So I've, I founded a company called Tracklight. We do uh, basically a self-guided process for companies to assess their business risk and their IP, but for attorneys it automates their intake process, generates more revenue, makes it completely scalable, and allows them to practice law. And so I will be joining the moderator, so that's probably the most you'll hear from me on this. And then um, I'm joined by Jules, who's the founder of Hire and Esquire, which is, as long as you promise to stay with me. Uh, yeah, so we're a legal labor marketplace. We automate things like that a staffing firm would do, but also things that an e-lance would do, but for lawyers. Um, so we're matching law firms with in, uh, and in-house legal departments with flexible attorneys on demand. And we're just launching our permanent placement service this month. Also, attorneys would work. Um, yeah. 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 Put a little TM on it. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be joined by the three people sitting in the front here. First, Ned. Um, so Ned is from Ibrevia. Did I say it right? Yeah. Um, whose software is based on artificial intelligence technology. It was developed at Columbia University, and, and it helps analyze and summarize contracts. And Ned and I have known each other for almost three years. He's the first person I met with in legal tech. He was at Demo 12, and I was super excited <laughs> to see someone else in the legal space. So, And then two new friends here. So we have Sally who runs LegalZoom's 
Attorney Services Department, which works with over a thousand attorneys nationwide. And um, prior to LegalZoom, Sally was GC at a large international tech company, which apparently is a mystery. And <laughs> <laughs> after she worked at a variety of um, different size firms. No, it's a company called Tiger Spike. So primarily. Okay, and then we have Josh, Joshua, who's Cleo's lawyer in residence. He didn't send me his 140 um, character <laughs> things, so that's all I'm saying about Joshua. I was on a plane, sorry. Okay, so the first question for our panel, and I will hand it off to Ned. So is this required so that people can hear us over the, yeah, okay. Yeah. So can you tell us one lesson that you learned selling to uh, selling into legal or supporting legal tech? Yeah, so I think um, for what we do, really domain expertise has been pretty important. Um, really the impetus behind the brevity case of an entrepreneur feeling the pain themselves and conducting due diligence and looking for some ways to make the process more accurate and efficient. And I think that um, just having done the work and really walked in our customer's shoes has given us some credibility, um, help us to anticipate their needs. Uh, you know, it's uh, get pushback on different issues. We can kind of come at it from uh, the perspective of, of having been there. So that's that's been helpful. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say is the biggest lesson. So we'll just pass it on now. So um, what I've learned is that there is no secret. So I guess the first thing is selling to lawyers is hard. Um, and the second is there is no secret or shortcut or magic bullet. Um, lawyers tend to be very risk adverse, as I'm sure many of you are aware, and they don't like technology. So we, when we started four years ago, we didn't use a computer. They would dictate to their secretary, and we're like, we're here to sell you a SaaS product. Um, and that didn't work so well. Um, but um, I think the, the, what we learned is just kind of continually beating down the door, continually brand and, and um, getting to the point where they've heard of us and they know we're not going away. Helping their clients, or sorry, not their clients, their peers. Um, that is the biggest lesson. So we just keep at it. Our sales cycle was 12 months to start, and now it's about ish. Um, but it's it's long and it's hard, and you just have to kind of hang in there. Uh, sort of to build on what Jules was saying, I view it from a slightly different perspective because we're not actually selling anything. We're trying to develop tools to help lawyers, and even then, and I mean, the reticence towards it is astounding. I would say, though, that I've seen more shift in the last 18 months than ever before, and the tides are definitely turning. And even some unlikely places, a few of the attorneys that we work with have been practicing for 40 years, and there are some more tech-savvy people that we actually do work with. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily... I mean, obviously, it's it's easier with the younger crowd, but it's not. It, it, it just takes time. It really does. All, all the guys that don't use computers are dying or retired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all them all. So Clio uh, makes a platform for uh, for law firms and law departments to manage to manage their cases, their contacts, their communications. So we sell directly to lawyers. So a little different than some of the people. Well, just Sally up here. Yeah, um, and I agree with everything that these guys have said, but there are a couple of key things that you also have to keep in mind when selling to lawyers or law departments, and that's word of mouth is huge in the legal space. Um, BTI, their mag clientist, how many people read that blog? Nope, oh, one in the back. Okay, so here's a note, here's a note to take. BTI has a great blog uh, on business development for law firms. Really fun to read, um, and as the name kind of suggests, it kind of looks at it from a client point of view. Um, one of the stats they throw around is about 63% of companies that change law firms tend to do so on the recommendation of another colleague that they see in another company. So they're out playing golf, or they're down at the playground watching, they're watching their kids, they talk about law firms together. And it's that word of mouth that really drives a company to switch law firms. It's weird. Um, and we're seeing the exact same thing with the lawyers that we work with. So if we do a good job for one law firm, and they like our software, they will recommend us to other companies out there. So word of mouth is the driving force in legal sales. Well, 
thanks, Josh. And I would just add, I had a really interesting conversation with one of the people who's very early on, and he said, instead of just trying the top-down approach, try the bottom-up approach mm -hmm. with Wiggle and, you know, find some raving fans who are associates or maybe, um, you know, in the for us anyways, in the marketing department, because that might be a good place to start. And so perseverance and persistence is the way to succeed. So it's a big test. In there. So this is a little bit of a prelude to the second panel, which is going to talk about some of the challenges and problems for in-house. But what do you think is the top problem to solve? right now in the space. So, so I think one of the, and I don't know if it's isolated just to tech, but um, one of the top problems to solve generally is just, I think a lot of the tasks do, don't necessarily require their level of expertise. Um, and I think some of that can be addressed through technology, whether it's on client intake with IP or, um, just for example. Yeah, as an example, <laughs> a random right. example. Yeah, or, or, you know, with what Jules is doing with um, kind of different business models looking to outside resources um, so I just think uh, you know addressing that problem is, is an important one and, and technology can be an important part of that um, so I think the biggest technical challenge is um, making technology not seem like technology to law firms because they, do, they get a little scared of, of new technology an automobile but we're selling a faster course we're just like the legal we work with, but we're better, faster, cheaper, and you don't have to worry about this thing behind the curtain that's um, enabling that, that you can log into if you want, but you don't have to. Um, so I think that for, for us, there's all sorts of things happening. Nothing is honestly rocket science. It's nothing that hasn't happened in other industries before. It's just about packaging it the right way for especially the big law firms to understand and want to do and making it we're going to save you time, we're going to save you money, we're going to make you more efficient. That's what works, but the technology is is there, um, but not too scary. Uh, so part of my job is working with lots of different firms from all over the country, and it will range from solo in Alaska to a fairly large firm in Virginia. And you can imagine with that many different lawyers, you know, our systems have to be pretty intuitive. And that is the biggest thing I would say, especially when it comes to dealing with lawyers, because they're all such busy people. They need something that's going to be straightforward and simple and easy to use. Um, again, you know, it's amazing how many bells and whistles we've got on our sort of back end system that they need, um, and would help them so much if they just took the five minutes. I, I mean, I know we all know we don't need to read the instruction manual, but you know, really digging in and what's available there. I know from my experience as general counsel, I was tasked with the impossible job of sh shaving our legal budget in half, and I did it. And I was very creative about it, not only using different types of firms. We were using uh, DLA, which wasn't cheap, um, and we switched from that to boutiques. But I also found different legal sort of tech aspects to really help. And I'll be perfectly honest, I used legal Zoom before. And people thought I was absolutely crazy. I just did not have the time or the money. And I was looking for any solution. And it is out there, and they are developing. And I think the biggest thing is just don't be scared to sort of try something out, because even if you test it for three months, you'll be amazed. But actually do the demo, do everything else, because I think a lot of people make assumptions about what software can and cannot do. So is the question aimed at in-house legal tech, or just legal tech in general? All right. So problem number one, I'm going to, oh crap, I started with one. Now I have to have it too. Uh, is for in-house is it's the only part of a company nowadays that is pulling more people in rather than outsourcing. You look at every other aspect of a corporation, outsourcing as fast as they possibly can. Um, and legal departments aren't. They're in-housing. That's the phrase. It's really crazy. Um, because the outside costs are so huge that they can't justify it anymore against the budget. So I was talking about having to cut the budget in half, right? 
So legal tech needs to show value in order for a law firm or an in-house to then the five minutes it takes to do the, do the demo or to watch the YouTube video isn't gonna happen. So problem number one, value. Problem number two is ease of use. Um, because quite frankly, how many people here are lawyers? Look, I went to law school, law school, I will call people out. Uh, and how many people took a computer class? Oh wow, okay, a self-selecting crowd for that. Whoops, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did not in law school, and so there's a lot of software that I've had to pick up really on the fly. I was working with a legal technology company and being able to explain it adequately to lawyers. Um, so it has to be simple out of the game. So value and simplicity have to be combined. That's my answer. All right, so um, we are going to do just one quick final tip. So the idea of a quick final tip is, first of all, it's singular. <laughs> just kidding, Joshua. Um, but seriously, if you could just give one, how can they improve their sales to in the legal space? So I think this is uh, something you can say just persistence is key. Um, it can be a long sales cycle. There's multiple touch points and just following up and uh, being persistent is very important. Um, I would say it's don't have an ego. The best sales are when you get rejected eight times and then someone comes to you three months later and like, oh, I thought about doing something and I found your you know, site on Google. And they're like, what? Seat in their head and they reject you and it's horrible, but they don't remember. You remember. Get over it. And then when they come to you and say, I have this idea, we think we should use you. Like, oh, that's such a great idea. I really am so glad that you, that you, that you discovered that on your own. And again, I'm not really the sales necessarily, but you know, don't be scared of trying new things. You never know. Most of the legal tech solutions that are out there are actually a lot more affordable than they used to be. And you know, just give it a shot. And you'll be pleasantly surprised, I think, with most of them. And a lot of them have trial periods that you can work with. So ask for feedback from your clients and then act on it. And that simple step will turn them into raving advocates for you, and they will go out and get you business. That's my tip. Okay, and my tip, based on a meeting that I had in the past 48 hours, is if you kind of expect nothing and start ignoring people, they actually will all of a sudden <laughs> be interested. So it's not like playing hard to get on purpose. It was just like, oh. Really? So I'm going to sit in the room and you're going to ask me how much this is and then you're going to ask me for a proposal and I just thought I was here doing yet another demo. So sometimes you just have to set your expectations lower. <laughs> so. um, okay, well that's it for our panel. We can do a few minutes of, if anyone has any questions for anyone on the panel, just, you know, it's a small enough group here. So just go ahead. So uh, when you're, when you're Try to sell to large law firms. Does uh, anybody ask you the ROI question? And if so, how do you answer? No. <laughs> they don't ask the ROI. Because it's lawyers. <laughs> yeah, for the most part. Say 80 to 20. You obviously include that, and you need to know that. Um, but every once in a while, like, we'll talk to like, a chief operating officer or someone in the finance group, and we'll ask that. But for the most part, Time <laughs> okay. okay. on touch points. You're approaching a firm, you never reached out to them before. Mm -hmm. Who is your first touch point going to be? Is it going to be the office admin? Is it going to be by the name partners? Or are going to try the bottom? Yeah, so I mean, we found it really varies. Um, I'd say about probably half the time of going through a partner, the other half of going through knowledge management. Um, so it's often you know, just who we happen to connect with at a networking event, or some personal contacts, um, we've had both. Chapters over our website. Um, I think ultimately the, the paths converge, so you need buy-in from both sides as well as from. Um, but uh, really, the entry point is very, very shortest route right on LinkedIn. Yeah. 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 That was actually going to be part of my follow-up. Uh, <laughs> as far as reaching out to them, are you cold calling? Are you trying to schedule an in-person visit? Is that the commitment you're trying to get out from the initial contact, or are you going through LinkedIn? And if so, what is the next step? In then is it a visit or scheduling? Yeah. I mean, we've actually never called um, 
So uh, yeah, it's usually, I mean, right now, you know, we're still a fairly small company, so it's just been kind of managing intake that comes in over our website or someone will say, hey, this is interesting to a friend. Um, so, so far, all of our, our leads have come from those sources. And we actually have something called the Legal Tech Toolkit, which right now it's part of Evolve Law. Uh, right now it sits on the Tracklight website um, just because it doesn't have a home because we don't have the Evolve Law website yet. Uh, but what we want to do there is put, and anyone who has a legal technology company, just shoot me an email. And um, we put all the information there for the companies. And I've just found that if you collaborate, we're integration partners with Clio. So we did a sales training um, effort with Clio and help, you know, helping each other sell each other's products is really a powerful way of doing it. So I don't do cold calling. So if we're, if we're doing cold calls, because we did a three month experiment with cold calls. We had everyone, including me and my other two co-founders, our CTO, do cold calls and sit in the room with our salespeople and said, I know it sucks, but we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we'll do it too. And um, it sucked. It didn't get much business, but we had a couple bits of business, and one of them was White and Peace, and they're one of our biggest clients now. So I guess with cold calling, it sucks. The ratio is bad, the hit rate is bad, but it does work. Um, it's not great, and it, I don't think it was a good use. So we scaled it down pretty significantly and focused on the things that worked. Um, but in terms of actual selling, I just I think in person connection for the first time is probably the best. So I literally stalk people. Um, if I <laughs> Meet someone, I look at their top social media, I do that, like I know that sounds creepy, but that's what like I go to every law firm event, even if um if I'm not interested in the topic, because you know there'll be 20 law lawyers hovering around trying to sell to you, and then you flip it around and try to sell them, which is gonna be fun. And um, and then you know, and then once you make that one connection, you leverage that as much as you can. So we tend to have to triangulate and have multiple points of contact in one firm. So we say, oh, we're just talking to your friend over there. And like it might have been a five second conversation, but if you can name drop and say, like, you can talk to your buddy. And like, you know, we're in the office. And it just kind of that, that's what works. And so we triangulate and do it. I guess the one funny thing also is if you fuck up, it doesn't matter because most law firms are five the mail, just try with another one. It's all good. <laughs> if, if you were launching a product today that we have with student event, what would be a great source for a community of lawyers online? Like about some board or some place where there's some active turnover attorneys that you would go through the time to make the appearance and just sustain some sort of um, presence for your new product that you have to challenge the launch. Leo We we hold a conference in October. It's the 19th and 20th of this year in Chicago. There are gonna be 700 lawyers there. Um, and they all talk to each other, and it becomes a, a great kind of knowledge sharing environment that they take out to all of their different environments. So it's really become a sustaining platform, not just for us, but for people to attend, like Sally did mention. And, um, you know, to go back to your point, how do you open up that door? I've tried everything from phone calls to like people that I've worked with in the past, and it's amazing how many obstacles you will face. Um, Persistence is key. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it's interesting cases. I mean, there's things like wealth council, there's state planning, and those are actually becoming a lot more active. And you go on and say ABA, and they've got various so LinkedIn groups now, depending on subject matter as well as size, all these different areas. Some are good, some are not. It's really just a case of trying them out and seeing what works. So were you talking about an online platform? Let's talk about an online platform, though. I really appreciate it. Um, if, if any other, specifically online, my head is not so there So are, are you thinking of developing one? Is that your question? No, or? no, no, no. <laughs> just, to, just to identify where, you know, this is more of a new topic for me, and I'm at that early sketch stage where I'm just writing down like this and I, I would like to think that I can get advice from people that have probably gone through plenty of lousy places and have come up with spots that they find productive. So what's well, we have market segment? The uh, trial attorneys. Okay. Uh, people that regularly make court appearances. Aboda okay. is good. Um, where? Sorry. Aboda, if you're looking okay. at LA specifically, there's the LA County Bar Association of Trial Attorneys. That's going to see an online 
they don't really have to monitor. Um, so a lot of it is still done in person, and to be honest, it's going to stay that way. Um, so change it, let's go ahead. So also take a look at uh, ABA's mailing list solo sets. Um, you can get a couple of advocates on there. That goes a long way. LinkedIn, 95% of lawyers are on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and so take a look at groups that, again, focus on your specific target market. There. So, and don't forget our legal tech group mm -hmm. that 1400 yeah. started. We're going to take the last question before we switch it over. I was actually wondering how much, how many, do you get a lot of clients uh, um, because maybe counsel has pressured them to start adopting technology? Speaking as former GC, because I was going through those bills going, I'm not going for that, I'm not going for that, that. You're me, you're charging me for three hours for a simple employment. No way concerned. So yes, any way that you can see automation and some of my friends who are GC's companies way bigger than what I was doing with, they now mandate it because they're under such pressure. Mm -hmm. They've got more work, they've got less people, and they've got to look at ways to improve scale and cost. Yes, that's like the, ma the magic, right? If you can get an in-house GC to say, you need to use this technology, the law firms and the lawyers that service them, but it's a lot harder than you'd expect. Um, but it is like that is the way things work. Um, we spent now like three months getting on the AIG member list. It was horribly painful, and now it's awesome. Um, so I think that it's just like it's one of these things that yes, that's the way a little bit, but it's you can't just do that because that's just much time. But yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you all for. Questions, and we're going to turn it over to Amy and Roberto. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I guess my first question is How many of you? Oh. Oh yes, hi, my name is Amy. Uh, I'm general counsel at a Patch of Land, which is located out on the west side. Uh, we do real estate crowdfunding, and um, uh, I'm also founder and organizer of the uh, LA Legal Hackers uh, meetup. And I'm Roberto Facundis. I'm the GC of a company called Tongle on the web west side. We uh, crowdsource online videos and advertising um, for companies like LegalZoom, as a matter of fact. And uh, we've done 70% of uh, Lego's YouTube channel, had a Super Bowl commercial, and, and numerous other clients. But uh, being in LA it helps with all the video production people, and I already know there's at least one in the audience tonight. Um, so I think our brainstorming session is intended to uh, perhaps spark ideas for people like the gentleman in the purple shirt um, <laughs> and see where maybe there's gaps and legal tech solutions that uh, all of you could use. I have a quick question How many people in the audience are in house? Okay, all right. Um, how many people are in private practice? Okay, law, start law startups? How many are not attorneys? Cool. Uh, for the non-attorneys, what do you guys do? Sorry? Oh. Okay. All right. That helps us too, a bit. Yeah, I think it does. Um, I mean, I think there's a, an obvious question, but maybe we'll save that. Things can say. I've got kind of a self-serving question. I'm actually curious what legal tech solutions people are currently using in the audience, to the extent there's maybe things that I'm not aware of, and maybe there's obvious gaps. Um, anybody want to shout out companies? I'll start with Iron Esquire. Iron Esquire. As one. Um, <laughs> Cleo. Cleo. Um, Legal Zoom. Legal Zoom. All right. So those are the layups. Dropbox. Yeah. Okay. Dropbox. Live Note. Evernote and Live Note. Hold on, hold on. Let's start jumping over here. Relativity. Relativity. 
Concordance. 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 Yeah. 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 You see it? 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 Law pay. SharePoint. SharePoint. Law pay. Law. Law pay. Okay. Law pay. That's actually probably really helpful. DocuSign. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Contract cloud. What is it? Contract cloud. Contract cloud. Case map. That would be a case map. I'll throw out. Um, oh, this is a very prolific. It's good. Yeah. I'll throw out uh, Visa now. For immigration. Teleport. Higher right. Higher right. Higher right. Should we go old school? Yeah, the original. The Now it's Google, right? I don't want to pay for it. I'm not paying for license. Yeah. Deal approved. Deal approved? Deal approved? I think that's probably a pretty good list, more than I yeah, definitely I've never thought of. Exactly. Yeah, some of these are new. Um, so, all right, that's helpful for me. I mean, you know, it would be educational for me to go through and take more of all these new things. Yeah. Things. yeah, but I mean, yeah. that's good to hear. If we're taking pictures of the ones in front, it's probably helpful. Um, so, I, I don't know, when you, one of my questions is kind of, What's your pain point? What hurts in the morning when you go into the office that might be able to uh, might help from a legal tech where creating that solution for it? The tracking changes in Word. Dig in. The tracking changes in Word that comments. Tracking changes. Tracking changes. Other than tracking changes. Let's <laughs> <laughs> say so, full inbox.
So that would be my Jesus for the Lord. So. <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, absolutely. Because it's just referrals, like you were saying earlier. You just use your colleagues use it if you have a problem. Um, yeah, the transparency and actually the law firm is bigger and greater. So I think that's probably a pretty good one for now. Just kind of a question on that. Who, who do you refer to? Do you go to word of mouth? Do you go to Martindale? Do you go to Avo? What source are you using to find It space? just depends on what it is. Um, like, Right now, we uh, are moving into more states, right, for our real estate closings, and we need to find in the small ones. I actually use we use Avo, right? We mm -hmm. use we actually use Meetup, so we find uh, attorneys who are very integrated into like the hard money market in their local community, so that we don't have to explain what we're doing to them. Um, but when it comes to more corporate size stuff or, or other specialized markets, it can be my network, referrals, um, I've actually used a bunch of legal marketplaces before, um, just wherever they come. Hope related to this, about the in-house attorneys and how you feel that you're perceived by, Sally, you mentioned being told to cut the legal spend by half. Certainly the perception is that the in-house counsel is two things. One, um, just, hey man, yeah, we got sued. We hired Kirkland and Ellis. I'm sure we're gonna do the best we can. Can't really tell how it's gonna go, because we all know the jury. And that infuriates management. And number two, they're the department of, you know, sorry, this thing works in 49 states, but it's possible that in New Hampshire, this might violate one of their rules, so can't do it. I get it's going to make us $50 million, but nope, can't do it. And, and I, I'm sure it's changing. Like, I've, never, I've been an attorney in companies, but thank God I've never been an in-house attorney. What's what's your, I'd love to hear from you guys, anybody else in the audience about? I think that still exists, and I know it still exists mostly because of the clients that we deal with and the clients that I'm negotiating contracts with on the other side, which is you know, a lot of the larger corporations that have established in houses and practices and, and, and they can be really difficult. But what I, I see at least on my end and kind of the companies that are like my peers or our peers smaller is there's a lot less of that. I'm willing to take a lot more risk because the reality is if something terrible happens, then we're all going to be unemployed anyway, but we're in a startup, so the likelihood that we're going to be employed anyway is probably going to happen. Uh, regardless. So I think you know I think it's partially your risk level. And with management, I think with a smaller group, you're you're part of the management team, and so you're kind of directing them in a lot of ways. And, you know, you're not so much just you know kind of separated at the end of the table. It's like, oh, let's just run it by the lawyer uh, to make sure at the end of the deal that you're kind of more in at the beginning. So I think it's changing at least it's changing with smaller groups and smaller startups, and certainly in the bigger companies that you're running into. So, the Atlantic Monthly actually came out with an article, I think one or two weeks ago, and it was about the naysayer in chief, right? Specifically the GC or the CLO. Um, I think I think a lot of companies do uh, run into this problem. I think a lot of legal, firms, uh, legal departments may run into this problem. And I think it is. it depends on how that legal department approaches the problem. Right? If you say, no, you can't do that, it's legal. Obviously, they're never going to come to you again. And everything is about diplomacy, right? So you have to say, okay, so this is what you want to do, that's illegal, but what is your goal and how can I get you to yes? So I don't see us as necessarily um, we're the naysayer in chief. I think more forward thinking in house councils, uh, we see it as we're like a legal solution architect, right? You tell us your goal, we'll figure out how to get you in the, the most uh, legal and risk-free manner possible. I'll give you one kind of quick example about, I think, the litmus test for organization is, do they require an NDA? If you require an NDA, you're in the, the no group. No, because people understand that everything's not really that complicated. In most, obviously, certain industries, it's different. <laughs> No, I have found I, I go to a lot of meetings like this, and I have found that certainly with lawyers, and I have a lot of partners, attorneys that deal with online. But you know, do you find yourself like, that I don't know technology so well, 
So I kind of want to skirt the whole technology issue in house uh, because I don't know it that well. Um, so we're just going to try to put it under the part or you know. And if you do do that, do you ever go outside to find consultants at the terminals and say, I mean, I really need to sit with someone that knows. And so technology is a fundamental part of our company. If we don't know our own technology, we, we can't learn. Um, that being said, uh, there are a lot of more seasoned and experienced attorneys who may not be uh, so adept at adopting new technologies, um, or, or even staff. It doesn't even have to be the GC or the in-house It can even be a program, right? And so I think it, it really is a thing. Um, I think leadership and efficient, uh, we need to be adaptable and really stress that with the staff to, to make sure that the staff is, is comfortable adopting new technology. I'll just chime in too. Um, so we don't do consulting, but we get requests for really like, just another kind of new technology, but we don't have our lawyers. Can you find a lawyer that already knows this to work um, and if it works they can maybe pick up lawyers how to do it. Um, so we are actually like have soft partnerships with like Ned and Mary and other bunch of other people at companies where our attorneys get trained on them and then can just drop them in you don't have to like totally um, kind of dive in and train people yet but you can test it out with some Well um, wondering if these are the pain points. Is there anything that already exists that addresses pain for somebody to build? Well, so for example, for billing, I know there's certain getting, right? Yeah. But it is really expensive. It's for like the Microsoft League of the camera. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's like two thousand dollars a month or something like that. A lot of small legal departments can't afford that. But you can tell me if I'm wrong, because I haven't done a, 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 I haven't found a surrogate like solution for small departments. Oh, okay, so I guess I should talk to you. Yeah, so there are a couple ways to do that in Clio. Um, one is you can invite uh, your outside counsel to share that matter, and they can build directly into your system in Clio. Or we've had some other instances. You guys are using Clio. Here's the account that I have purchased for you, and I have access to that account as well. So all of your work has to go in here. That would be awesome. Right. Um, for the legal for finding the right for referrals, there's a lot of legal marketplaces, right? Um, I think the and I, I've tried a lot of them. I think the question is. Which marketplace is right for you for your specific needs? Have you tried that? I don't. I'm pretty much like 99.9% referrals. And it's colleagues or law school friends or that's it. I don't even know. It's one of those when you search somebody's name and they'll like have it on top or something. It's kind of ignoring like this. <laughs> well, this is classic, right? I mean, that. that, that that so much of in-house law and legal practice generally is CYA, right? So like, okay, well, we hired this guy to handle this matter, and we thought it was a dead, I mean, obviously we were gonna win, she was obviously made, I'm not making my list, I'm just saying this how it's perceived. And then we lost it, and tell me again, what website did you find this asshole that lost our case, right? And and so it's always gonna be. Uh, yeah, I think that seems like everything is a bit for litigation. Look at the same five law firms regardless yeah. if you have that budget. But for the day to day stuff, for you know, from an employment agreement or you know, help negotiate, that's what you can get some money. And not to, 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 yeah, or you <laughs> um, but part of what I do is, and what we do as a company is actually use and we use the system for our network store, which is something that Apple uses that's by. And we survey these attorneys, and the number of attorneys I've talked to were terrified at the thought of being surveyed. But it is 
is this a trend we're going to do with it? Are they going to buy? Are they going to be able to monthly? And it works amazingly well with consumers. Now, this is different because we're talking about small business owners and families by and large. But even on a business front, we've seen our users become more and more sophisticated as you know the internet has sort of opened them and we have up, but in turn it's um, and how I align them is through the problems. Um, and then just being a lawyer myself, vetting them and making sure they actually know what to do. But if you're the person responsible for finding that lawyer, would you rather Go to a site that uses data on claim rates, on um, feedbacks and surveys from prior customers, and like, hey, I golf with this guy, he might yeah. work out. Like, I mean, are you, are you asking me, or you just? I would absolutely do too, rather than the first one you described. Why? Because I don't. Well, number one, I mean, Sally, in the case of the surveys, these are yeah. people talking about one-off things. Number number one, I don't think there is good data. On, on who's happy, you know, if, if, if Wells Fargo gets sued for an employment matter, their they're in-house people are going to be extremely reluctant to give any kind of actual feedback on, on a website like that for, for a major risky matter. And I would be much more likely to get accurate data by calling friends of a friend who are going to tell me what really happened. So, I mean, I... I, I hear your point. I I, I I don't think it comes down to who you play golf with. I think it comes down to who you know, who you've known for a long time, whose opinion you trust to give you. A, they're not, you're not even going to email. You're going to have a conversation. About it. I agree with that 100%. There's no Yelp for lawyers. It's happening, people. There it's is Yelp. Work. There are lawyers on it. They're working on it. It's, it's crazy. It's happening. But to me, you know, slap me with a defamation. I feel like that's why I've been real Oh, not that it's the Josh King and Abba on a daily basis. Yeah, you're still in business. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the first thing you're going to do after your buddy gets referral is you're going to hop on the internet and Google that. Um, yes, that's so true. So that's right. where the data starts coming yeah. in. And what we're seeing is um, services out there like Premonition Law are starting to dive into court records to look at arguments about fees, to look at win loss ratios, to look at subject matter expertise, and they're building this big database of who's the right lawyer for the right price point. And other services are bringing it up like this. So the data is getting finer and finer. It's just a question of how many sources can we get online for that. So the referral. I think we'll take this offline, but I, I, I think premonition is extremely problematic. Uh, well, I agree with you. It's only, it's only litigation. Only and it's court records, yeah. There's, and there's lots of, and that's, I mean, Provast, Swain, and Moore is going to show up as nothing, mm -hmm. uh, and Kirkland and Ellis are going to show up as nothing. And the guy who's handled 700 uh, defense of, of, of mortgage foreclosures is going to show up. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this. I'm a I work for a big data startup. I'm an attorney that got really sick of working at big law firms and all their old boy network BS. I'm just telling you guys. From my experience, I've spent a lot of time talking to in-house counsel. This idea that there's this like data out there is it's just gonna be a ton of challenges, not the least what Amy was talking about, about people's concern about defamation and, and, and other ones. So we've done a lot of this by the way. What we realize is that we can't do the outside. But what we can do is collect data which we are doing on People show up at time. Do they come back to the same clients over and over? What is their personality type? What's their picture? Sure. What's the sure. feedback that their references and their customers say about them? And you aggregate it in a way that is in sum and not calling out any one person. And that's the future. So again, this is ancient stuff. There's nothing right now that is a single source of the truth that is trustworthy. But this is why the legal tech entrepreneurs in the room exist. We are building it and it will happen. You should be early adopters and, and consider it. Okay. I'm building it too. Well, okay, I'm uh, taking over this conversation. Well, I, just, I, just, I just wanted to comment that in the SaaS industry, you have one metric that you're store. So would you, and apologies, I'm over here trying to take pictures and do stuff. So if someone's already said this, but like, would you recommend this lawyer to somebody else? So if you could just have a, it's like, somebody build that into, um, I don't know. There's so many, I listen to all of this, but there are so many companies out there.
there are different actions, and they have a reaction, and then there's a repeat action. So we're tracking every, all the users and finding that person. Okay, so the large um, corporate, uh, well, large law firms, I'll name it, because it's like a situation, not law firms are the higher marketing people just to find negative comments about their values and wipe them off the somehow, some way, or track everybody from seeing those comments. So I don't see a lot of Yelp kind of thing for attorneys being in the indicative world. It just needs to be at scale. Because we've done a we've surveyed over four just for the attorneys that we work with, over 10,000 surveys. Um, when you get into that sort of realm, you start seeing patterns, you start seeing things. And some of the items that Mary raised are actually the most important for a long time. Highly pleasant. A lot of it, I hate to say it, but some of it is legal advice, and there's a lot of attorneys that give good legal advice despite what our reputation might be. Um, but ultimately, we want to actually work with them. We want somebody who will call you back. I know both in my current job and then when I was GC, I would hire people to call me back at that time. And you know, they, everybody has an excuse, right? And sometimes it's both lies. A lot of times it's not. There's a lot of bad news out there. And it's oftentimes not about the policy of their legal fees. It's just because they have horrible customer service. And that is something that we can track. And it is something that, you know, if you're looking at one or two, then obviously it's not going to be a realistic scale. But if you're looking at mass, it does. Well, there's a wealth of data that we're not considering as well, and that's the, the billing and performance rates. Um, and they're pulling what, I mean, tens of thousands of bills like monthly um, and being able to compare firms based on performance and their billing. So, and in house counsel at larger corporations are relying on this data. So, it's a question of when does it scale down into the smaller companies? Hey, good. Maybe the solution at some point is to get all this, all the metrics and put them together with some type of country club school. But very interesting. And there's yeah. probably a way analytically to do that. I mean, you don't have to have to do it You know, where you can get those referrals from trusted people and then bring that into the technology that gives you kind of the result of wanting to return it. Maybe that's the new technology that should come out of this. Um, but let's see. Let's one more. The concept's not really that new. We've had probably a whole gen AD ratings based on. The judges, attorneys, etc. Mm -hmm. You're just changing the focal point, you're just changing the crowd that's doing the evaluation. So the model exists. It's sort of like paper discovery turned into electronic. Same yeah. same things, just doing it from different Does anybody use Martin anymore? Nobody <laughs> does. That's it. Nobody picked up yeah. that part, but it's already something that was done. Right. So it's it's just it's like turning it into a Uber instead of a taxi service. I mean we still look at Martel and we'll see that all of the a team of people who are basically vetting lawyers every day. And it can be everything from, you know, it's like a checklist of various different things, and that's one of them. So we don't just look at one thing, and a big, big guy is going to be a big snack. And, you know, it's not for everybody in the kind of sort of order. I don't want them to pull that into the back or something. I don't want them to wait three, two weeks or, you know, so let's make Martindale sexy somehow. <laughs> <laughs> we widespread adoption. So uh, with adoption, um, so what do you mean from a lawyer's perspective? What's we talked a little bit about like what drives adoption or what some of these little technologies need in order to be adopted? And what do we think? The investor cases probably survey you know gaining momentum. Well, law school, right? So we all used to use Lexus because Lexus guy gave us subscriptions or one out a year, and then we got trained on it and used it. And now, but for a long time, that was it. So I actually have a question, which is, you know, I think if you're some huge company with huge, you have a lot of leeway to go in, maybe negotiate fees, flat fees, alternative fee arrangements. You have you have a lot of leverage to make such demands, if you are a very small in-house department, maybe just one or two people, maybe your company is a startup, right? 
like, do, do you feel like you have a lot of leverage to demand this of law firms that you use? Because I was like, used to asking it before I was at the startup of the larger company, it was kind of part of the conversation. So, you know, and it's, if you ask for it, oftentimes you get it. Um, doesn't mean it's a meaningful discount, but, you know, it can happen that the person is going to be established. I don't even like that design, but um, let's. Startups use your name. We work with 14 and law 200 firms, and we can use two of their names. They negotiate that into the contract that we cannot talk about. If you are using something, allow yourself to be like promoted from the startups because they will facilitate the additional adoption. Yeah. So, we're finding a lot of our in house customers are the, so it's not the in house, let's say, we need up here. It's, the rest of our company is like 2015. Why aren't you up here with us? It sells as a product, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What else can we do? Well, I have one. I, I, uh, me and Ari, we run the uh, LA Legal Hackers Meetup, and we uh, run that group for a lot of events to try and facilitate discussion. Uh, we have uh, legal hackers in general, so we get a lot of press, a lot of uh, speaking opportunities to try and spread the message, so I think that's a good forum. Not a plug, though. No. <laughs> Not a plug at all. But so, hashtag. So, <laughs> you'll have to sit down if you don't want to I'm sorry? You'll have to sit down if you don't put the ball along. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> and then there's also um, oh, also collaboration. Um, other, you know, the big LA bar, we also have Lacka, with the Fair Legal Association, mm -hmm. you know, collaborating with them. Or yes. I mean, what about like integration? We talked about that over here somewhere, but you know, having some of these kind of work together, so you've got like your CRM, so you know, you've got Salesforce that syncs with Dropbox and DocuSign, and it's kind of integrated, so they kind of build off each other. We do that. It's a tech, right. So it's, I mean, it's a tech play on yeah. making it simple. So you've got one dashboard, maybe. So you log in and you say your inbox, and you see your inbox, you build a dashboard for the lawyers that has prioritized maybe your inbox with, you know, all the other software services that you have. Or got it. Okay. Sir. There it is. I would say commit to trying new things. Lawyers tend to be like the kings of the fast followers, the slow leaders, like actually trying new things. Perfect, and like if you're in a big company or big firm, like designate someone to try stuff out. Your lawyers or the people there will be really excited about it, um, especially if it's a younger person. But like try something and get to it. Our employees refer to it as tender for lawyers. Pretty much like this. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> 